Yes, good morning, everybody. Let's put the stopwatch on, otherwise I have no idea how long I'm talking. <laughs> so yes, yes, still crazy world, but let's just continue, right? And um, you know, even in these times, you can have a lot of benefits because, well, you can really test your faith, right? If you walk around every day uh, fearful, your faith is not strong. That's, that's what the Bible says, your faith is weak. So let's build on your, on your faith, you know? Let's, let's use this time as, as a testing, as a, as a practice, as a school, you know? In these times, you can test your faith. How uh, calm are you in difficult times? And Pastor already said that from left to, to right, there are all kinds of, you know, tribulations. But um, the Bible says, even if you see people falling down on the street, and I don't believe we're there at all, but even the Bible says, thousands will fall on your left and 10,000 on your right, but it will not harm you. So we have a lot of promises that we can be saved, but you have to be faithful. You have to have faith. And that is what conquers everything. So um, today I want to talk about uh, a subject as a Christian. We have a lot of jobs as a Christian, right? First step, get saved. First step, get saved. When you're saved, then you can choose. Do I go work for the Lord? Do I do something for the Lord? Uh, am I an active Christian? Or am I just satisfied with being saved? The Bible clearly says to him that worketh not, but does believe on him that justified, his faith is counted for righteousness. So only your faith gets you saved. And after that point, you have a choice. Am I going to work for the Lord? Or am I just going to be relaxed and like, okay, let's just uh, write this, this story out, right? And I think, of course, as a Christian, we get this big promise. We get eternal life. Jesus died for us. I mean, he bled for us. He went to hell for us. He did everything for us. So we should do something for the Lord, right? And... The Bible says faithful over few things. I'm not talking about big things, but few things. Can you do few things for the Lord? So we have one task, and I want to specifically talk about this task as a Christian this morning. And the title of my sermon is Casting Down Imaginations. Casting Down Imaginations. This is one of the jobs we have as a Christian. You can choose if you are a partaker of this job. And it's not a fun job. You know, well, it, it is kind of fun, but you will not make friends with this job. What does that mean? Well, the Bible has a great definition of what does mean if you cast down an imagination. Because many people imagine things that are not true. Many people believe things that are not true, that are not according to the Bible. Even Christians believe things that are not in the Bible, right? If you believe you can work yourself to heaven, that is not in the Bible, right? If you believe that hell is not real, well, that's not in the Bible, see? So there are a lot of imaginations and we have to cast them down. And many times people don't like that because they love their imaginations. So let's start with the Bible. Let's start in 2 Corinthians 10.1. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 in the beginning. And we're going to see what, what, uh, what this description is of Paul. And he was casting down a lot of imagination. And I want to focus on Paul also this morning. <clears throat> he was a great Christian, a great, great Great Christians and Muslims attack Paul and many fake Christians attack Paul and they say, oh, Paul, he was not a real prophet. Did. No, he, was, he almost wrote the whole New Testament. I mean, he was a great, great prophet. But look at the Second Corinthians 10, 1 in the beginning. <clears throat> now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. So that means he talks a little bit rough. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So sometimes we as Christians have to be bold. That means be courage, uh, having hard language. And people might think, oh, this guy is not a real Christian. Oh, he's not spiritual because he uses hard language. No, that's not true. Sometimes you have to be bold and still be meek and gentle. It, it is possible. Look at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that means fleshy, it's not from this world, right? But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we have to pull down, down strongholds. What does that mean? Pulling down strongholds. This is a job not for Paul, this is a job for as a Christian. We have to go to people and pull down strongholds. So when I went to the definition of a stronghold, 
uh, it has two definitions, a stronghold. And it's funny, this is not from uh, a Bible. This definition is just from uh, a dictionary. And it has two definitions. And the first one is the carnal one, and the second one is the spiritual one. It's, it's really beautiful. So the first one, the carnal one, it, carnal one, is a place that has been fortified so as to protect against an attack. So a stronghold, this is a physical stronghold. Think about the movies with all the armies when there was still swords and spears and shields, right? Back then, and you got all the knights with the helmets and all the metal and everything. And they fight against and they want to invade this tower and it has all kinds of strongholds. That means it's fortified, it's strong, so the enemy could not go in. This is a physical stronghold. But do you think that Paul was talking about building actually towers, strong towers, strongholds? No, he was talking about a spiritual because he says our weapons are not carnal, um, uh, because it's, it's spiritual. So what is the second definition? This is the spiritual one. A place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. So this belief is strongly defended. Many beliefs right now are strongly defended, right? If you talk to a Muslim, they strongly defend the Quran. Is it true or not? If you go to a Hindu, they say, no, reincarnation. When I die, I will come back as this and this and this. You know, I, I talked last week to a Muslim girl and she was laughing at me because I believed in the Trinity. And she said, no, we, you serve three gods. I said, no, I serve one God. No, no, no. I said, but there are three in one. Ah, that is impossible, she said. I said, how is that impossible? With God, all things are possible, right? If, I, I told her, if God wants to be seven or a million, he can do that. He doesn't do that, but he can. I mean, with God, everything is possible. But many beliefs are strongly defended, and this is a stronghold. So if a Muslim says, no, I go to paradise through my good works, because that's what I believe. They believe, I got a Quran right now, so I'm reading a little bit too. So they believe their works will get them to paradise. If you live a good job, if you live a good life, you will go to paradise, right? This is a stronghold that people, what says here, strongly defend. And even if you go to ISIS, they, they really strongly defend it by beheading you. <laughs> and, well, the Muslims that actually behead you are great Muslims because they do exactly what the Quran tells them. I found three, no, four verses so far that tells you in the Quran that if somebody doesn't believe on Allah, you can behead them. So it's, it's a good Muslim. But it's strongly defended. But what should we do as a Christian? Should we, should we talk with a Muslim like, oh, that's great for you. I am so happy for you that you find your way and I got my way and the Hindu has her way and everybody has their own way. Should we just do that? No, you're not loving. It's the easy way. The easy way is just like, hey, take care. It's nice that you bless Allah. That's the easy way. But that's not the good way. The hard way is most of the time the good way. And the hard way is to tell them, look, uh, there's a different way to heaven. Without, uh, with works, you cannot go into heaven. And we should tell uh, people this stronghold, it needs to go. So what Paul said, pulling down strongholds, this is what he meant. Because strongholds are beliefs that are upheld, that are defended. And we have to pull them down. We have to tell them, no, this is not the way you have to go. What they do with that information, that's up to them. But we should tell them. This is a, a difficult task of a Christian. Also this week, I talked the same day with a Jehovah Witness and with a Muslim. Both of them, I talk like uh, 30 minutes, almost 45 minutes. Sometimes you just invest a little bit, you know. But uh, the man, the Jehovah Witness man, was so hard to convince. He was defending his stronghold so hard. I mean, even verses when you showed them, he was actually turning his way. He was turning his face from the Bible. I said, but Jesus is God. No, oh, he's not God. He's not God. I said, look, if I can show you right now, do you believe it? He said, no. Da, da, da. I said, if I show you right now, do you believe it? He said, okay, let me see, let me see. Really like this, right? So I said, okay. So I went to one. And I said, look here. He was doing like this. I said, look, you said you want to see it. He was just turning us away. I said, look, you want to see? Let me just read it. Okay, okay, let me, let me see. And then I read them, I believe, uh, God was manifested in the flesh or something. Yeah, that's just translation. That's just Greek. That's Hebrew. That, you know, I said, oh, do you talk Hebrew? No. Or do you talk Aramaic? No. Do you talk Greek? No. But, but you don't accept this because you know about the translations. 
people don't want to hear that. They fight their stronghold. They believe this and they, want to, they don't want to go from that. But you as a Christian, you have a job to tell them. You have to tell them, look, uh, this is not the way. And what they do with that information, again, is, is their choice. There is free will and you cannot pers persuade them. So casting down strongholds is a very important job as a Christian. Because if they die with that same stronghold, they will go to hell. And maybe you can change their mind. And some of them, they will listen to you. Some of them. Some of them. It's not a lot. But last week I talked also to a Muslim guy and he was willing to hear. And I got the Quran with me. So I showed him first things from the Quran. Like, oh, the holy book, right? It's just a small little book. But, you know, and then they have respect for you. And then you say, no, but, but the Bible says this. And then you, you, you put the Quran back in your bag and you say, look, but the Bible says this. And he actually prayed to accept Jesus. So that was, that was a blessed day. But most of them, you know, they don't listen. They just don't listen. So um, also, it says here in verse 5, we just continue. It says here, casting down imagination. So first we talked about strongholds, you know, pulling down strongholds. But then it says casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought of the obedience of Christ. So let's, let's pause here for a second. First of all, pulling down strongholds. Every false religion is a stronghold that is keeping people back to getting saved. Cast it down. But the second thing is imaginations. Now we even talk about people that don't have a religion. Many people don't have a religion. I did not have a religion. When I grew up, I had no religion. And I was proud of the fact that I did not have a religion. You see, that's, that's how I was brought up. I was proud, like, yeah, I don't have a religion. Ah, foolishness. No, I was the fool. But you know, now I know that, no, there's only one way. But many people have imaginations. And you heard about this, this actress, very old, she was Betty White. Betty White, she died, and it's all in the news, and she became like 90 years old or something, or even older. And uh, she was a very famous TV actor, actress. <clears throat> and uh, Christians... They, they found clips of her because then the question is, oh, is she saved and where is she and so on. So they showed clips of Betty White, what her beliefs are. And she was in this talk show and she said, uh, this talk show host asked her, okay, do you go to heaven? Is there a heaven? What do you believe? And this Betty White said, well, my mother taught me that when I die, um, everybody goes to their loved ones. So if you love somebody really much, that's where you go. So even if you, if you were married three times, the one you love the most, you go to that person. That is, that's what she believed. But what does the Bible say? Casting down imaginations. This is, what, this is what you imagine, you know? And many people imagine things. Many people believe that it's black. I have a good friend. Since I came to this country, I have a good friend. I still have this friend. And in the beginning, um, he thought that if you die, it's black. And he was a Christian. He said, if you ask him, what, what religion are you? He said, I'm a Christian. But he believed when you die, everything is black. And whatever I said, I was even not a Christian back then. And I told him, no, that, that is impossible. It cannot be black. So I was already fighting with him about this, this, this uh, subject. But everything was black. That's what he firmly believed. But what is that? That's an imagination. So later, later well, very short after I got saved, I started reading the Bible. I started to understand doctrine. I understood the, what the truth is. And the Bible says clearly, no, there's eternal life. And even if you don't go to heaven, it's not black. You go to eternity, but eternity in hell or eternity in heaven. So then I showed them from the Bible. I showed them, look, Jesus talks about eternal life. He says there are many mansions. And I showed him all the verses. And he was very quick, quickly to change his mind. He said, oh, yeah, you, you're right. I said, do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior and now believe the right thing? He accepted Jesus. And now he believes, yes, there is eternal life, you see. But this is a job as a Christian. First, uh, pulling down strongholds, all false religions, tell them it's not good. But the second thing is casting down imaginations. Many people believe in aliens. Let's be honest. People believe in aliens. I have very intelligent friends in Holland. They believe that aliens exist and they will take you up and so on. No, cast it down. They don't like it, but you have to cast it down. But, but here we see casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So all these imaginations go against God and the wisdom of God. And what do we see from Isaiah? You don't have to go there. But I was, when I was reading this, it sounded like the devil. Because what, how, what did Lucifer say? He said in Isaiah 14, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. It's almost the same thing that we just read. Because it says here, casting down imagines, imaginations that exalt themselves to the knowledge of God. And that's exactly what the devil does. So all these imaginations, they come from the devil. When people believe in aliens, how do they believe in aliens? That is from television, that's from movies, that's from books, that's from false teachers, that's from Oprah Winfrey, you know? <laughs> people like that, they are false teachers. If you are a Christian and you get your knowledge from Oprah Winfrey, look, you have to really repent from that. I see Christians and they have quotes from Oprah Winfrey on their Facebook. If, you, if, if that is you, I am sorry, I'm going to unfollow you. I'm not, <laughs> not going to even check your Facebook anymore. That's wrong. Oprah Winfrey clearly says, no, there is more ways to heaven. Jesus is not the way, she says. So these are imaginations that many people uh, believe. But you, you have to tell them. You have to cast down that imagination, whatever it is. And you tell them, no, there's only one way, Jesus. Because I was thinking, why do people love this? Why do people love those things? Because there's no judgment. If you believe, that's what my mother believes. She believes when she dies, she just goes back to a place where she came from, and then she can choose if she can do it again. She just can, she's just like, okay, insert coin, and let's, let's play this, this game again. That's actually what she believes. So why does she love to believe that? And why does she hate her own son if I tell her, no, Jesus is the way? Because if you say Jesus is the way, there is judgment. There is judgment. Jesus means there is a real God that sees you, that knows about you. It's really personal if you accept Jesus. But if you believe in aliens or some, some life force, it is not personal. It can be everything. There's no judgment there. And that's why people love to believe in imaginations. But you have to tell them, no, Jesus is the one. He knows you. He knows your soul. He, breath, he, he, he put the breath of life into you. He knows the numbers. He knows the, the, the hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. Everything, every step you make. And that's scary for many people. And it is scary. So better, don't fight it. Just accept it. And he will be merciful, right? So if you, if you talk about an example, right? If you talk about a reincarnation, uh, what do you do in that situation? You, you are a Christian. You, you don't believe in reincarnation, right? But you talk to a Hindu person and uh, from the Hindu relief, uh, belief, I can say. So what do you do? Do you fight with this person and say like, no, you're wrong and this and that? No, you have to be careful. You have to do this very easy. You know, wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. So that means you can use some tactics, but it has to be innocent, right? But you have to be smart about it. So what you do, if I talk to a, a Hindu person and really believes in the Bhagavad Gita, I tell him, okay, tell me about your religion. What do you believe? Do you believe that you die? Yes. Okay, then where do you go? Well, when I die, I can come back, and so it, it depends on how you lived. And then you just use one verse. For instance, Hebrews 9.27. You don't have to go there. It says here, and it, as it is appointed unto men, once to die, once to die, not a thousand times, once to die, but after this is the judgment. You can use it. And then you, you see him thinking like, hmm, okay, that's, that's different than what I believed. And most of the time, nobody ever talked to them and told them, you're wrong. Most people, because if they are a Hindu, they only meet Hindus and they all have the same religion. So now you tell them, no wants to die and then maybe you can shake them a little bit you have to be really careful right okay but then I talked to that was last month I talked to a girl a Hindu girl and she said no but if you see a homeless person or a junkie she says if you believed a bad life before you will come back as a homeless person or you will come back as a junkie that's what they believe. So don't fight them right away don't ah, you're the ridiculous no just say okay 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 that's interesting but can I show you one verse? And then you show Romans 3.12. And it says, there is none that do it good. No, not one. And then you tell them, so if it is true what you believe, but the Bible says there is none that do it good and everybody sins. And you ask them, do you agree with that, that everybody sins? And everybody will say, yeah, of course, we all sin. I said, but, but with your belief, that means everybody will come back as a junkie or as a homeless person or as a dog or, you know, and I say this very respectful. And every time it gets them. Every time they think like, you're right. Like that doesn't make sense. And this is how you pull down the stronghold very slowly with a smile on your face and just being friends. And then you let them work themselves. You let them think, just be quiet for a second. Just let them think about it. I say, does that make sense? 
So this is what you do. This is your job as a Christian. Don't fight with people on the street. Just slowly tell them some Bible verses. Why? Because this is stronger as a two-edged sword. This, this is a strong, th this word of God is so strong. Show them one verse and this whole stronghold can crumble from beneath. And some people, they fight you. They want to hug this stronghold. They say, get away from my stronghold. Don't break this down. I love this, this stronghold. But some people, they listen to you. And then something can happen. Maybe you can go all the way. Maybe you can remove that whole stronghold. But then you have to replace them. If it is possible, and it is possible, many Hindus come to, uh, to Jesus. I, I mean, it's, it's really amazing what's happening, right? So many people say like, okay, you are right. That doesn't make sense. And then you tell them about the Bible. And you go to the Romans road and you tell them, no, everybody is a sinner and everybody deserves hell. And then you tell them, but you don't have to go there. Jesus died for your sins too. And then you just explain them just by believing on Jesus. It's enough to get saved. And people love it. So you have to repl replace the strong hold with what? The strong tower. Let's go to Proverbs 18.10. Proverbs 18.10. I'm so not going to finish this, but <laughs> let's see how far we get here. So let's go to Proverbs 18.10. And it's a beautiful job. It's, it's, sometimes it's not easy, but it's a beautiful thing, you know. Especially if you get to the point that you can get a Hindu person or a Muslim to believe on Jesus, that's the best feeling ever. I don't care what you do in life, that's the best feeling ever. Look at this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it into it. And is safe. And I always love this verse. You know, I love this name. It's a strong tower. So even in these times, why do you think that the Lord, it's not an actually strong tower, but it, it works as a strong tower. So what does it mean? You can run into it. What is a strong tower? That means it's strong on every side. It's round most of the time. And it's strong. It's, it's built like it doesn't matter where the attack comes from, from behind, from left, or from beneath, up. It's strong on every side. And that's why God says, my name is a strong tower. So when you pull down the stronghold, replace it with a strong tower. And if they get saved, hey, hallelujah, that's the best thing that can happen. But this is a very uh, difficult job. And this is actually what Paul did 24-7. Paul was on a mission. He was fighting Christians <laughs> when he was Saul. He was actually putting Christians to death. And then he had also an imagination, right? He thought that the Christians were wrong. But then Jesus appeared unto him, and he changed his mind, right? And then he became one of the biggest, the biggest apostles in the, in the Bible. So let's go to Acts 17, 15. <coughs> let's read this, and then we're going to close with that, yeah. Okay, let's, uh, I, I'm going to skip a little bit. So Paul went to Athens, and he went to Athens, and he saw all people uh, going uh, into idolatry. Acts 17, 15. <coughs> And when he was there, he saw the whole city idolatry. What does that mean? He was worshipping uh, statues, idols, and so on. And uh, Paul was just saying, like, look, what you, what you believe is wrong. It's not good. And he had a lot of problems. He was from synagogue to synagogue teaching them they were wrong. <clears throat> it says here, let's, let's just read this as, uh, as the end of the sermon. <clears throat> and they that conducted Paul brought him into Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed... They departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So the Holy Spirit was in him and he was stirred. He was, he was like annoyed even when you see it. And don't you have the same as a Christian? I have it every time. When I, even when I go to this street and I see the big idols, you know, the big statues there, I get stirred. I get, I get a little bit like, oh man, because, because you know this person is not saved. You want to save this person. Look at Paul said, he said here in 17, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And certain philosophers of Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemed to be a set of forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So this is what many people say, what is this for strange thing, right? In 19 it says, and they took him and brought him into Aragapus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. So they asked Paul, like, what is this new doctrine? You talk something new. But is it actually new, what Paul was preaching? Was it new? 
No, it agreed perfectly with Moses and the prophets. It was exactly the same doctrine from the Old Testament. But the people said, what is this for new doctrine? And is it not the same right now with Christians? When you bring the Bible to Christians, you say, oh, I'm a Christian, oh, great. Hey, and you show them a Bible verse. Is that in the Bible? What do you bring this new thing to me? Really? Christians don't know the Bible, so they think like it's a new thing. This book is old, and it's, it's still there. It's preached every generation. But many people say, hey, this is a new thing. When you say to some Christians, uh, if you die without Jesus, you go to hell. <gasps> what is this for new thing? What, how is that new? It's preached from left to right. But that's what Christians are, right? They say sometimes like, hey, this is a new thing. Same as that. Look at 20. For thou, for thou bringest certain strange things in our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. So people said like this is a new thing, but it is nothing new. This is the old wisdom from the Bible. I cannot continue the sermon completely. So um, if you end this chapter, I'm just going to end it here. When you preach these things, so, uh, like Paul did, he was not afraid of going into a discussion. You know, it's not a discussion. He just said it. But at the end, at 30, 32, it says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. And then so Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. So what do we see from the Bible? He was preaching every day. Every day he was preaching, and he was telling about Jesus, the resurrection, everything. And what do we see? Three separate groups. Some mocked. That's what you have. If you're a Christian and you tell about Jesus to other religions or to Christians, some mock. That's just what's happening. Some will mock at you. But it just says here, some, we will hear thee again of this matter. Some people just listen. Also on the street, you talk to them about Jesus. You say, you want to pray? Uh, not now. Maybe in another day. It's the same thing. But at the last, it says, a certain man cleave unto him and believed. So some people will believe. So I'm going to stop right here. The Bible says clearly we have to cast down imaginations. We have to pull down strongholds. And there are many people that will go to hell. And this is not a laughing matter. This is not a laughing matter. This is serious business. So if you have an attitude that people already set their mind up, that's a wrong attitude. You can change people's minds. You can. Maybe not of most of them, but, but some of them. Just if somebody talks to you and says, oh, I love God. And you say, I love God. But they, you know that they believe in a Hindu God. Just tell them, like, look, but do you know there's only one way? Just tell it friendly. Just tell them. And if they say, ah, yeah, you, you are a Christian, I'm a Hindu, and that's how it is. Okay, fine. But you told them, and the blood is off your hands. So that's a job that you have. So I'm going to close right here. Thank you for listening. Amen.